It is lovely to see y'all. It's so good to be here with you at The Journey. I'm Pastor Jennifer. If we haven't met yet, I'm one of the ministers here at Memorial Drive at The, at the Journey, and it's just my joy to greet you here in the name of Christ. Today we start a two-week worship series called Verses, not like Bible Verses, which is, fun fact, number one autocorrect for part of my last name, Virus. Just the verses. The, the, one for the, the number one autocorrect for Schreckengost is scroungiest. That's neither here nor there. We're starting a two-week worship, worship series called Verses, looking at what is in between two opposing sides. So today we're talking about going to church versus being the church. And what we find is that in that in between, that verses, there is a healthy tension that happens when we look at what it means to go to church, but also to be the church. Not exactly the kind of verses that's making all of us tired in October, Astros versus the Yankees, but similar, right? I always forget how tired I get in October. It's the occupational hazard of living in Houston with a great baseball team. Um, we're going to be looking at this through the lens of one of the pastoral letters, 1 Timothy. It was written by the Apostle Paul from when he was in Macedonia, around the early to mid-60s, and that was written to Timothy, who was a leader in the Ephesian church. Paul had commissioned Timothy to the ministry, and Timothy had been an apprentice to Paul, um, learning alongside of him, being taught by Paul by doing, by being a leader. Um, Timothy first served as an assistant to Paul's ministry, and then he served as sort of an extension of Paul, sort of a liaison between Paul and all of these churches that Paul had planted. He would often be the one carrying and reading aloud the letters that Paul had written. Um, and, but then eventually, Timothy became the leader at the church in Ephesus. Timothy is a great example for us of someone who moves from passive participant, recipient of God's grace, to an invested, active person being the church. We sometimes talk about this as the difference between um, membership versus ownership, right? Timothy is active now. He is about the business of the church. So today we're looking at the tension between going to church versus being the church. I'm very glad that you're here. Um, I invite you to hear these words from 1 Timothy. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that, is deserving full, that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well, holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Almost five years ago, off the coast of Malta, Captain Joynal Abedin found himself and his crew of seven in his ship, an 885-ton tanker called the Hephaestus, in the most extreme storm that he had ever witnessed in his 25 years of seafaring experience. Malta, this island, was completely engulfed in a thunderstorm with northerly winds of 35 miles an hour or more. The captain radioed the authorities, asking permission to seek shelter close to shore, but before he could navigate to safety, the ship hit the rocks, 
relentless 20-foot waves just pounded the ship into these rocks. And the captain and his crew made their way to the seafarer's center with nothing but the clothes that they were wearing. Father Joe Borg, who is the chaplain of that mission outpost, the Seafarers Center, was interviewed later after all of this happened. He noted that when the residents, the people who lived on Malta, found out what had happened to this captain and his crew and their ship, many of them showed up with blankets and food and clothing. The Hephaestus ran aground on February 10th of 2018, right near the place where the apostles Paul and Luke were shipwrecked almost 2,000 years earlier. It happened to be that it was on the date when Malta celebrates the feast of St. Paul's shipwrecked. Coincidence? I don't know. But certainly fascinating to the theological imagination. The experience of being welcomed and cared for after trauma at sea is something that both Captain Aberdeen of the Hephaestus and the Apostle Paul would understand. When Paul writes to Timothy in verse 19 that there are some who have shipwrecked their faith. Wow, what an image. Here, 1 Timothy gives us this real-life peek into an early Christian congregation or gathering of congregations that was having trouble embodying the fullness of the good news in Christ. So Paul writes these words about some who have shipwrecked their faith. Just between two and five years after he had had his own shipwreck experience. If we, if we look in the book of Acts in chapter 27, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, we hear, so Paul is on this ship. He's headed to Rome. He's a prisoner. So he's going there to be put on trial. And one thing leads to another, and they've left at an inopportune time. And a northeaster sweeps down from the island, and the ship is caught in this horrible storm. Paul is captured. The story is told by the Apostle Luke, who was traveling with them, who wrote the book of Acts. And we read that now Paul stands up and urges everybody on board to keep up their courage. Despite the fact that they're trapped in this storm, they're certain they're going to be um, shipwrecked, that the ship is going to be destroyed, they're going to be run aground. And Paul urges them to keep their courage because, he says, not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Paul says, last night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep your courage, men, Paul says to everybody on board, like 276 people, a big crew. Keep your courage, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, Paul says, we must run aground on some island. So fearing that they would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern, pray for daylight, in an attempt to escape from the ship, some of the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. And Paul says to them, unless all of these men stay on board, they cannot be saved. And so the soldiers who had heard this from Paul cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. The ship strikes a stand bar and runs aground. The bow is stuck fast, would not move, and the stern is broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf into those rocks that you saw a picture of. Some of the people on board could swim, and so they jump overboard once they strike that sandbar and they swim to land. The rest there who couldn't swim grab a hold of whatever pieces of the ship they could, the planks, the boards, and they float to safety on land. And the part that always gets me, I love this part, once they're safely on shore, Luke writes that we found that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us an unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us because it was raining and cold. Paul's giving in 1 Timothy a recap of his conversion. Paul's experience of salvation begins, if you read Acts, on the road to Damascus, but it definitely doesn't end there. 
Here in in Acts 27, we read that Paul still believes that God's grace is following him and protecting him and is carrying him through the storms of his entire life. Paul is sharing his testimony to Timothy, affirming that Christ saves, that Christ came to save. Paul testifies that, that through Christ, God's waves of steadfast love and merciful compassion have washed over him and changed everything. Paul knows what it is to be held by grace and by love. Will Williman, who's a United Methodist bishop and also a professor at Duke Divinity School, he teaches um, uh, the practice of Christian mission, has written a preface to the pastoral letters, that's First and Second Timothy and Titus, in one of the Bibles that I own. And he talks about how sometimes we romanticize the early church. We think, oh, if, if the church today could just be like the early church, everything would be so much better. But the truth is, First Timothy shows us that we actually have a lot in common with the early church. The pastoral letters demonstrate that, that to us. They, they show that spiritual formation, life in the church, happens when specific, actual, real-life tensions within the congregation collide with all the ideals of the Christian faith. When we go to church and we hear the good news, if that's all that happens with it and we don't apply it into the nitty-gritty of life, we're not living out our calling to be the church. Willimon writes that contemporary Christians who think the church ought to be more spiritual that is above the mundane, nitty-gritty problems of living in community with other Christians, who can often be a pain in the neck, those are his words, not mine, will not care for the pastoral letters. Here are writings that take seriously the mundane but utterly necessary task of church administration among folk who don't always want to be led, teaching among people who don't always want to know, and discipline among disciples who would rather do their own thing than follow the apostolic faith. Church is messy sometimes, but church is also the vehicle, the vessel of faith. Willimon continues on. He says that communities often in that early church, just like today, the community that Paul was writing to, found themselves torn asunder by fruitless speculation on various myths and esoteric practices and differences of opinions. Paul had had it with these stupid and senseless controversies. Those are words that Paul writes in 2 Timothy. Paul had had it with these controversies that merely breed quarrels. I don't know about you. Can you think of some controversies in the church breeding quarrels today? We live in a time of contention, of deep polarization, that has also been brought into the church. If you've lost count election days in two and a half weeks, register to vote, go vote. And even within our denomination, churches are voting and choosing sides about whether or not to stay in a big tent denomination where we can agree to disagree on some matters or, to put it another way, whether they should jump ship. All of this leads us to feeling tossed around by waves and winds. Friends, can you think of a time, maybe it's now, but maybe it was sometime in your past, when your faith was shipwrecked? When, as Luke wrote in Acts 27, verse 20, neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest raged, and all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Sometimes, We forget that we're held by God's grace, and it seems like all around us that we're enveloped in a raging storm. Paul writes to 1 Timothy and encourages him as a church leader that we will be saved, that Christ came to save, and we can trust that and rest in that and know that it will carry us through the troubled waters. The good news that Paul carries and conveys to Timothy as he leads the church is the same message that he gave to those 276 people on board the ship in Acts 27. That the ship is not perfect, 
when they were preparing to stay on board, there was no longer any food. There was no tackle. There was no lifeboat. They were adrift. But unless we stick together, we cannot be saved. The church is not perfect. We so often forget what the essentials of our faith are and get caught up in the non-essentials. We forget to put our teaching into practice. We forget to be vessels of the grace of God. Maybe another way to put this would be to say that there should be a productive and healthy tension to be found a balance when we hold orthodoxy, right belief, and orthopraxy, right action together. Paul knew the power of Christ to save because Christ didn't just come to earth just like we don't just go to church. Christ didn't just go to humans. He became human. Christ became flesh for us just as we are and just as we are called to be and become the body of Christ for the world. Church is not just a place we visit. It's not just a ferry boat to carry us from one shore to another. The teachings, the gospel, those are our vessel. And we, the church, we're the crew, all held by the ocean of mercy and grace from God. When I was in seminary, one of my textbooks included this little line drawing, this illustration in the chapter on the Reformation. And it noted that the church was often associated with the symbol of the ark, the ark that carried Noah and the people through the flood. And even though oftentimes the waters are rough and the church, the ship seems to be tossed about, that it is a worthy vessel. I don't have any tattoos, but in my head I have three. I just haven't had the time and the money and, uh, and not been pregnant at the, all at the same time to go and get them. Uh, this is number two on my list because that is such a compelling image of what the church is called to be, a place of sanctuary, a place of safety, even when the waters are rough. Willimon writes that the good news for churches is that we are, with all our faults, the very body of Christ, the visible form of Christ in the world, God's answer to what's wrong with the world. Christ does not leave us to our own miserable devices, doesn't abandon us because of our failures at faith. God keeps working with us and correcting us and teaching us and patiently guiding us and reaching out to us through 2,000 years of church in encouraging scripture like this one in 1 Timothy. Our task as the church is to remember that going to church is important, but being the church is our mission. It's our calling. I have long been fascinated by the image of the boat, of the church as this vessel carrying us through God's world, God's ocean of mercy and grace. It started with that image in my seminary textbook, but it translated to this budding desire to someday, in all my free time, hobby time, um, to, to learn how to build a boat. So I looked on Amazon a, a couple of years ago and still have sitting in my cart, not purchased yet, these books that teach you, that show you, how to build wooden boats. And what I've learned by looking at some of the screenshots of those pages of the book is that there really has got to be a big difference between reading about how to build a boat and learning how to do it at the hands of someone who knows. Church is a vehicle of faith where the gospel, the teaching, all those things that we hear about when we gather on Sunday morning are better caught than taught. It's easier for us to experience the grace of God than it is to explain how it works. I've got a couple of kids and they will ask deep theological questions and it's so much more difficult to explain the faith than it is to show the faith. And that's how it is in the world too. This vehicle of our faith, this church that has a mission in the world, has got to be kept ready, seaworthy to go.
In my house, one of the books that's in rotation right now that I love, it's by a favorite author and illustrator of mine, Nikki McClure, who does beautiful, amazing um, paper cutting illustrations, is called The Old Wood Boat. And it tells this story about an, an old wood boat. It opens with, um, with the boat not in the water, but an old wood boat that's been taken out of the water long ago and is sitting in a field next to somebody's workshop or garage. And it's sat there for a long time, being rained on, the sun drying the boards and cracking them, blackberry vines grow up all over and around it, a family of raccoons make a cozy little nest in there and call it their home for a while. But everything changes one day when another family comes and purchases the boat from this old man and carry it to their home, and they get to work restoring this boat, replacing the boards that need to be replaced and, and polishing off the rough edges and applying new sealer on all the cracks, repairing the sail, making it once again seaworthy. I love that invitation for us to think about what it would be like to take up our hand in caring for an old wood boat so that it can once again be placed back in the water and go from one island to another carrying good news, carrying us from one adventure in Christ to another. After his own shipwreck, Paul shared the gospel with the people of Malta. He found them to be most hospitable. He stayed there for three months after they invited him in and shared food and invited him into the fire. He taught among them about Christ and the gospel. He healed some on the island. He planted the seeds of the gospel there and started a church, and that's why Paul, to this day, is the patron saint of the island of Malta. Out of what seemed like a tragedy, God worked for the good. And when Paul prepared to sail on from Malta to Rome, the people that he had met there, who had become his brothers and sisters in Christ, equipped him, and they equipped him well to continue his mission. They provided supplies that were loaded on to the ship that he took from that place to his next destination. They prayed for him. They had come to believe in the power of Christ to save, and they had become the church in action. Were there differences between Paul and the people of Malta? Were there differences in Timothy's church that Paul writes to later on? Are there differences among our church? Yes. But healthy spiritual formation requires a discernment of the essential from the non-essential, the core of the faith from the superficialities. It's a spiritual wisdom to keep forming one's community on the basis of the chief affirmations of the faith and to leave the peripheral concerns at the margins. That's Will Willimon again. So will our faith hold in the rough waters? I think if the extent of our faith is going to church, it will not. That's the equivalent of keeping the ship grounded. There's a big difference between going to church and being the church. And if we can carry the truth of the gospel that Christ can save to the uttermost, if we can carry that with us and share it wherever we go, whatever happens, we can navigate any storm. And so today, at this time in history, in this place, how are we fully inhabiting our calling as the body of Christ? How are we moving from just going to church to being the church? How are we caring for this vessel of the faith that has been entrusted to us? How are we investing in it with our time and with our talent, with our prayers, with our action? At a time when some wonder if the church has run aground, and is seaworthy at all anymore, I believe that even then, even now, God is at work in us. In Acts 27, Paul tells the people to either swim ashore or grab a plank. Even if the ship goes down, he tells them, God is with us. God is at work for us. God's grace, God's steadfast love and mercy are enough for us. See, I don't have hope in the church because we get it right all the time. 
I have hope in the church because Jesus has made us to be his hands and feet, the bearers of the gospel, even when we find ourselves in troubled waters. In verse 12 of this chapter from Paul to Timothy, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Christ has entrusted us and strengthened us for ministry. Who are we being called to carry the church to? Who's looking on and wondering if this thing is seaworthy? For whom will we be the church? We might be surprised by who God carries us to next, but we shouldn't be surprised when God continues to work through us, when we commit ourselves to both the going and the being of church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy and gracious God, I give you thanks for this day, and I'm humbled by your word. Help us, O oh God, to be your church, to not just claim that you had good ideas and that you are good, but to live that out in our actions and in our world. There are so many places that need this good news. And they're not even all that far away, God. So inspire us and equip us to be a worthy vessel to carry your grace to every shore. In the name of your Son, our Savior, amen.